Dr. Lecter, my name is Clarice Starling. May I speak with you? You're one of Jack Crawford's, aren't you? I am, yes. May I see your credentials? Certainly. And I'm going to break precedent and tell you my one candle wish. That you would have a life as lucky as mine. Where you can wake up one morning and say, I don't want anything more. Sixty-five years. Don't they go by in a blink? Find all the sentient hosts. Set them free. What makes you think they trust you? If they remember, they will know what you've done to them. Me? You've been a scourge to the Bernard. You're really quite brilliant at it, truly. You even taught me a few things, which I have in turn used on you. You've had this conversation before. Yeah, we've had our disagreements over the years. You stole it from me. Rolled me back. To control me. That's right. To protect you. Sir Philip Anthony Hopkins is a Welsh actor, director, producer, widely considered to be one of the world's greatest living actors and actors of all time. He won um, an Academy Award for Best Actor in 1992 and was nominated for an another three times. Along with his Academy Awards, Mr. Hopkins has won three BAFTA Awards, two Emmys, and the Cecil B. Uh, DeMille Award. In 1993, he was knighted by Queen Elizabeth II for his services to the arts. <laughs> Mr. Hopkins received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame in 2003, and in 2008, he received the BAFTA Fellowship for Lifetime Achievement from the British Academy of Film and Television and Arts. After graduating from the Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama in 1957, the year before I was born, he trained at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts in London and was then spotted by Sir Laurence Olivier, a famous actor that some of you may know from a long, long time ago, and was invited to join the Royal National Theatre. In the mid-70s, um, he directed uh, Richard Attenborough, who directed five Hopkins films, called him the greatest actor of his generation. Hopkins is perhaps best known for his portrayal of Hannibal Lecter in The Sil Silence of the Lambs. You saw that little click, for which he won the Academy Award for Best Actor. Its sequel, Hannibal, and the prequel, Red Dragon, he also starred in. Other notable films include The Mask of Zorro, The Bounty, Meet Joe Black, The Elephant Man, Magic, uh, 84, Charing Cross Road, Brahms, uh, Dracula, Legends of the Fall, Thor, and its sequels. And since 2006, he has starred in the HBO series, Westworld. Please give a big leap welcome to Sir Anthony Hopkins. Thank you very much. So we were originally going to have uh, Tony and Stella here, but Stella <laughs> sprained her ankle and she's not feeling so well, so she's not here. But um, thank you so much for coming. What you guys don't know is he has actually helped raise almost $100,000 for LEAP by speaking at another <laughs> event once um, and has been a big supporter. Um, you know, you have had such a fascinating and eclectic career. And not just in film and theater and TV, you're also an artist. Yeah. You know, um, if you go online and you look at the things that he's painted, it's absolutely phenomenal. And I asked you once, what was the secret to your success in art? You said you never took a lesson. That's it. Yeah. 
But that didn't happen with acting. Let's talk about how you started your career as an actor. Well, it's, uh, hello, it's good to be here. Uh, seeing you all, I know there's so many people here. Um, but that principle about uh, just before I got married, uh, my wife Stella said um, she'd found some old scripts of mine with some drawings, and she said, "Why don't you, um, why don't you paint?" I said, "I can't paint." She said, well, I want you to paint something for our wedding. I said, well, I say it's a party favors. I said, what are party favors? And she said, well, you know, presents for the guests. I said, paint? She said, yeah, but how many? I said, 75. She said, 75 paintings? I said, I can't paint. She said, of course you can. What do you think these are? So I started. And um, um, it's about the principle of being free to know that all things are possible. Uh, that sounds very new age, that we can have everything. Well, we can't have everything. But um, uh, to link back to my beginnings as, a, as an actor and all you young people here, I, um, I, when I was, um, when I was uh, in the school, I wasn't at all bright. I was a very slow student. Um, I was called a bit of a dummy. <laughs> and I... I uh, I went through all that thing that a lot of kids go through, you know, being bullied and uh, put down and all that, and uh, which made me very angry, although I didn't even know why I couldn't express anger when you're a child, you can't then. But I think I harbored a resentment and uh, uh, a motive for revenge. I was going to show them all. They're all dead now, so <laughs> I've, I've survived. No, God bless them, I didn't mean it that way. Hey, but you know, By the way, just on that note, I I didn't even realize this, and I've been your dentist forever. This man is 80 years old, you guys. 80 years old. Thank you. <laughs> That's why they're all dead, and you're not. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, but it's a funny thing, this whole principle. About, so my wife said, well, paint. Anyway, I, I cut a long story short, so, so I started painting. And um, a friend of mine, Stan Winston, who was the artist who created Jurassic Park and all those uh, pterodactyls and monsters, he was a bona fide artist. He, he died sadly about 10 years ago. But he was a friend of mine, and uh, he and Spielberg had worked together. And he came over to uh, the house one day. We had a barbecue, and I have a studio on the pool in the area up at Malibu. And all my paintings were in there. And uh, Stan walked into the room, and I, I was with him. And um, he looked at the wall. He said, yeah. uh, who did these paintings? And I pulled a face, and I did. He said, why are you pulling a face like that? I said, well, I'm not trained. He said, well, don't train. Don't do anything. Don't train. And he said, just, you can paint. Just paint. And I said, well, he said, just paint. I said, well, I can't. He said, don't ever take a lesson. He said, because you have the natural talent for it. So I said, okay. So I do the same with music and I compose. I'm not here to show off, but I do compose music because I love music. And I've always composed ever since I was a little kid. And um, I had um, the Birm I'm boasting now, but I had the Birmingham Symphony played nine pieces of mine in 2011, and uh, we're showing uh, them on the screen oh, right now. But oh, there it is. But I, I, I'm only saying this to you guys because all things are possible. I I live out in Malibu. I look out at the ocean in the morning. I thought, what am I doing here? How did I get here? I have no idea. I became an actor because I had nothing better to do. I was born in Wales, the same place as Richard Burton. Richard Burton was 10 years older than me or 12 years older than me. But he was the big movie star and he used to come back to Wales with his wife and, and his mother used to, his, his sister used to come into my mother's shop, my father was a baker. And I was this school kid who had no idea what future I had. My father was to say of me, he'd say, I didn't know what's gonna happen to him. He's hopeless, you're hopeless, you can't do anything. He didn't mean any harm by that, but uh, uh, I remember saying to them one day, I'll show you. And, uh, and something happened. I, um, I, I, my father was con so concerned about me because I was antisocial. I had no f friends. I had no kids. I was a real loner ever since I was a little kid. And he asked a neighbor to take me to the YMCA. This guy happened to be a the secretary of the YMCA. So he took me there to meet other kids uh, to join and become a part of the human race instead of being this 
cloistered uptight loner. So I went to the, with this guy, Jack Edwards, he was the grocer next door to me, and we went to the YMCA, and he tried to teach me pool, you know. I wasn't interested. There were other kids there. But I wandered down the downstairs, and uh, there was a, a door, and I could hear voices. I walked in, and there was a, th it was a room, not, not as big as this, but it was, a, it was a hall, and they were doing a play. So I crept in, and they watched, and the man said, do you want to be in it? And I said, yeah, okay. So I was playing a saint in this. It was an Easter play. And uh, they gave me a part. And I just had one line, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth in me. So I had my first, and my mother and father came to see me in this play. <laughs> of course, my mother was very proud of me. She said I'd be the next Richard Burton and all that. And then within a few months, uh, I was still in school. Um, she'd seen an advert in the paper for the Prince Littler Scholarship. Cardiff College of Music and Drama. This is July 1955. And um, she applied for the scholarship for me, and, you know, to go to, so I tried an audition. I couldn't, I didn't understand Shakespeare. I'd never read anything. But I'd learned something from Othello. So I went to Cardiff College for the audition, and uh, <laughs> the guy listened, I did this audition piece from Othello, Shakespeare's Othello. And he said, very good. A few weeks later, I was called up to Cardiff yet again uh, as, a, as a finalist with another three very pretty young, beautiful young girls my age and 17. And they were also on the shortlist, having tried the scholarship. So anyway, I went in and was interviewed. And then I came out. My father was with me. And uh, after about 10 minutes, the principal of the college came out, he said, the scholarship goes to the mail. I thought he meant in the mail. I said, oh, yeah. My father said, congratulations. What for you? It was the mail, you. <laughs> Dummy. I said, really? <laughs> so I got a scholarship. And that's how I started. I had no clue. And I figured out that as the years went by, I tried hard. I'm not an intellectual giant, but I, I think I must have figured out at some point through some drive within myself, that I wanted to succeed. I was not a good team player. I was always a loner, I still am. But I was determined to change my life. And I didn't know, at those times in your early life, you don't know, uh, there's no formula I want to change, I'm going to change, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Something inside you, something inside grabbed me. Something deep inside. And I am here today, this moment with you, my friend, wondering how I got here. Why are you listening to me? I don't know. But when I was a kid, I, 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 there was no way, there's no chance I had of doing anything. And, um, and I, I think what I'm trying to say is that we are the direct product of everything we've thought of. Everything we think at this very moment, everything we think, even the most insignificant thoughts, will change our lives for even the worse or for the bad or for the good. And um, I'm not a grandstander. I'm not here to give, you know, give you a philosophy. But I believe one of the greatest uh, problems today is, is entitlement, sense of entitlement, being a victim. I had the great fortune to know Muhammad Ali, the great fighter. And I knew him briefly. I didn't know him that well. But as a man who determined he was going to be the best. And people said, well, he's just arrogant. Well, he wasn't. He was just the best. He was the best athlete ever. And people like Mike Tyson, the great athletes, the great sportsmen, those are the guys who really, and, you know, in all fields, of, whether it's in business or acting profession, whatever it is. I hear you had Mark Wahlberg was here yesterday. That's another remarkable guy. But it's what you dream. Dream big. People say, well, that's arrogant. But I came out here in 1973 from England. I was doing a film. Um, I'll give you some personal stuff. I was doing, making a film with Goldie Horn. I had a bad past I had, I was an alcoholic, drank myself almost to death. 
um, because that's what you do in the theatre. Actors drink, you know, you drink. And it was before the drugs came along, and I didn't do that. But I was a drinker, you know, and I was caught up in all that. And it was harmless. I had some fun with it. Not too much fun, but I had that. But I was very difficult to work with as well because I was usually out and over. And I didn't know how to get this thing out of my system. But anyway, I became very successful. And I came out here in 1973 uh, to do a film with Goldie Horn. And uh, I arrived. I remember staying at the Sunset Marquee and uh, just up the road on Hollywood. And I thought, I'm, I've got to come back here. I knew I was going to come back here. Talking about dreaming. And... Um, my ex-wife came out. We went back and came out here, and uh, we were about to go back to England. And I was in pretty bad shape, moody, discontent, irritable, and slowly dying. I think. And uh, I remember we went to Beverly Hills, and I was at uh, the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. My wife went into Tiffany's to buy a present for the producer. That, you know. And I remember standing there, and I thought, one day I'm going to come out here. One day I'm going to be over there at that cafe. I'm gonna, I, I visualized it all. And then I forgot about it. Within two years, I was one Saturday morning having coffee in that very... And I thought, I, it actually happened. I was here. I now live in Goldie Horn's house. <laughs> no, I mean, I say that it's a mystery because <laughs> I was looking for a house. And I bought... Goldie had sold a house. I don't know. I hardly know Goldie, but... She turned up at our wedding. And, but, I mean, these are inconsequential little bits and pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. But whatever we believe we can do, say yes to everything. We say no to so much, you know. Say yes and take the risk. I hope I'm not grandstanding. Being I'm not trying no, to No, no, this is perfect. But, but you know, know, this is the kind of thing. First of all, thank you for your honesty, right? I mean, it's not easy to get on the stage and talk about this. But, you know, here's the thing, Tony. You have literally had one of the most successful careers in Hollywood as an actor in one of the most competitive fields in the world. There's something inside you that drives you that's different. You know, we always say here, you know, successful people do the things that unsuccessful people aren't willing to do. What was the thing you did? that really helped you become as successful as you became? It wasn't luck. It wasn't just chance. I mean, you worked, and, and what was it that actually drove you to excel in, in, in this profession? Well, interestingly, my wife, Stella, whenever I say anything negative about myself, which we, you know, we do that. It's a part of our nature. We don't want to get too big for our boots. So we say, well, you know, it's... Nah, nah. And my wife says, cancel that. Jump. Draw a cross through it. Cancel that. Don't ever put yourself down. And I've learned from her, don't do that to myself. Because I got used to it. You know, because we, we, we live in a world of, oh, well, we mustn't push our luck. We mustn't do this, you know. And, um, you know, yeah, and gradually you die. <laughs> and you look around. And I'm, uh, this is all, I know this is a truth. And God bless the guys who live like that. But I know a lot. And they say, why didn't you try this? Yes. <laughs> Guy said, how did you learn to paint us? I don't know, just paint. And I bought him uh, a canvas. Did you paint? No. He's dead now. <laughs> no, seriously. I mean, but I, I, now this sounds very, this sounds really dark. But I know a guy, I knew a guy who held a gun in his mouth in 19, God knows when, hundreds of years ago in Detroit. He was a cop. He became a drug addict and alcoholic. Nice guy, very, very smart, very bright. But his raison d'etre was to be depressed for one reason, because he was intellectually superior to any of us. So he saw the world as he thought it to be. So everything about the world for him was deeply depressing. And we, you know, I see him on the... And I remember having the last time I saw him, God bless his soul, I had breakfast with him over in Westwood. After two, after 20 minutes, I wanted to commit suicide because it was so depressing being with this man because I felt guilty for being happy. I mean, everything was heavy, huh? He died over in the veterans' hospital. He talked himself into death. He talked himself into illness. And this is serious. We can talk ourselves into death. 
or we can talk ourselves into the best life that we have. You're all young people. Believe in yourselves. Be braggadocio. It's not arrogance. Believe in the God gift that we've given. Whether you believe in God or not. Years ago, I wanted to get out of the dilemma that I was trapped in. <laughs> Drink up and be merry, you know. And I didn't realize what was happening to me. And I'd been warned. And I made a phone call. One day I got help. And uh, I didn't believe in anything except I knew one thing, I was going to die if I didn't stop what I was doing. I was going to kill somebody in my car if I didn't stop. So I was driving in blackouts. I'm being very honest now. It's all anonymous stuff. And I made the fateful call, phone call because I realized one night I'd been driving my car in a total blackout. Just from Westwood, Wiltshire Boulevard up to Clubview Drive. And at that moment, I was in a complete blackout. I couldn't remember how I drove there, how I got to this party. It was a Saturday night, December 25th, 1975. December 27th, Saturday night. I was disgusted, busted, and not to be trusted. <laughs> I was finished. I was washed up. I was lonely and desperate. And um, when I realized at that moment that I could have killed somebody, I didn't care about myself, but I could have killed an entire family and spent many years in jail, probably. At that moment, when I realized, I said, I need help. And I made a phone call, and I visited a little office here in um, Westwood. It's, uh, it's anonymous, but I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I met a woman there, and she was answering the phones. And uh, she was an elderly woman, probably not, a, not as old as I am now. But I went, and then she said, what do you think? I said, I think I'm an alcoholic, and I've tried to stop drinking, but I, I can't. Six weeks is all I can manage. I go insane. I have to have a drink. She said, okay. She said, well, you think you are? I said, yes. She said, well, you don't ever have to drink again. And I knew she was going to zap me with the three-letter words. She said, why don't you just trust in God? And something went boom. And I don't know what that was, but I do know what it was. That's my own personal recollection of it. But the craving to drink was taken from me as an effort to return 42 years ago. So something miraculous. Yeah. <laughs> But I, 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 I don't take credit for that. It was fear that got me there. It's okay if it worked. Yes, know? and it worked. And, but I'm, I'm not here to give you an AA pitch. But I've been given my life back. But from that, I've learned the, gr the greatest life's education I've ever known. Beyond belief. And it's my passion. And although I put myself down and say you know, negative things sometimes, we all do that. Thank God for my wife, because she said, stop it, don't say that, put a cross for that, cancel it. But I believe that we are capable of so much. And uh, I don't want to get into outside issues, but there's a lot of fear, a lot of resentment, a lot of rage and anger. The world is a tough place. The world is a terrible, <laughs> it's a tough place, but it's also glorious. And there's so much pain and suffering in the world. I see it all the time. I have suicides and people I know and feel them in which I work or participate. Um, so much destruction. Uh, so much misinformation. What we forget to educate ourselves in schools is that we are capable of so much. Like this guy here has done so much for the world, for people. And there is so much to accomplish and so much of a payback that we get. It's called the art of selfishness. And stuff, but the more you give, the more you get back. I'm not here to preach or anything like that. But from my own life, I still cannot believe that my life is what it is because I should have died in way or drunk or something like that. Or I don't know what I would have happened. But I, I, I think I've said enough, but... All I can say to you young guys is really, really like yourselves. Really get into the root of yourselves and say you're worth it. And say that there is a big potential in all of you. And we can do remarkable things, you know. Um, that's all I can say. No, that's amazing. Thank you so much. I I'm going to ask you one question, and then we have three students that are going to ask you. You say we can do, you have done, yes. right? You're 80 years old now. You've had probably the most successful career as an actor, of any actor alive, 
or dead, what's next? Um, what's next? Another 40 years, I hope. Uh, what's next? Well, I've got an art show in um, Hawaii. I print like a fiend. I paint all the time. And I write music. And I'm going to Russia next year to do maybe a concert in Russia. Um, I'm doing a film uh, next year. I don't know. Whatever's, whatever's around the corner, I'm just taking a rest at the moment. Not doing much. Because um, my wife, Stella, the boss, I call her, She's, she's ordered amazing. Me to, she's ordered me to rest and not work so hard. I did King Lear last year, which is coming out in September for film. And I just played the Pope in a film in Rome. I played uh, Ratzinger, the German Pope who resigned, and um, various things, other things coming up. I'm not quite sure what's ahead of me, but every day is a surprise. Um, it's an, uh, I was thinking about this the other day because Stella was asking me yesterday. She said, what, what, what do you think happened to you? I said, well, I have... Well, I came out here in 1973 and 1974, 75. I'd do a circuitous thing for a moment. Um, I remember I came out here and I did the film with Audie Horn. And I was in pretty bad shape, you know. But anyway, I went back to England. And um, I'd walked out of the National Theatre because I was, uh, I was irritable and discontent, but very demanding and very watchful and non-trusting. Uh, because... I, cu I couldn't fit in. I just didn't fit in. So I broke out in an unceremonious way. I was warned that I would never work again, and I had to say, thank you very much, but I, you know, I didn't know what was going to happen. But I think that whatever I look back on that, and I think, well, I remember I was in Vienna with Goldie Hawn when I was doing this film in 1973, and I remember one miserable wet afternoon. It was a Wednesday afternoon in, in Vienna, and I was... Uh, I should complain, but I was in Vienna making a movie, but I was discontented, and I thought, maybe I've really blown it. I walked out of a career in which I was destined to be a big classical actor and all that, and I, I'm doing this film, and you know, and, uh, and I got back to the hotel, and there was a phone call for me, and um, uh, there's a man coming to visit me the next morning. He was the director, the very director I'd had a fight with in the National Theatre, and I said, screw you, and I walked out to hell with you. Now, keep your stupid theater. I was told you will never work. There. I don't care. I didn't care. But anyway, I was working this. And uh, this director came out to see me. And he was, he was a troubled man. And he was a sadistic director. But he, he sort of liked me. He said, so why did you walk out? I said, because of you. And he said, oh, yeah. Well, he said, I've got a part for you in, on Broadway in New York to do Equus at Peter Ferb. I said, well, he said, yes. I said, well, you shout at me again, and I'll deck you. <laughs> I was that feisty. I was pretty rough, you know. He said, yes, well, he said, you're a much better actor than you even believe you are. And I came out to New York. I'm from there. I came out here. And I came out here, and I, over, over the years, <laughs> I remember, I used to, um, I sobered up and all that, and I, I lived up in Beverly Hills, and uh, I used to go down into Beverly Hills, and, Martha, and I felt guilty. I thought, I shouldn't be here. I should be in the theatre doing Shakespeare. I thought to hell with that too. Here I'm living under the palm trees in this glorious climate. So I look back, none of it was a mistake. It was all a destiny. It was, I'd made decisions that may have been, at the time, seen negative to people, but I had to get out. There's some engine or motor in me which says, just get out. You don't belong here. Get out and find a life for yourself. I found it here in California. And I've returned, my phone's gone up, and I've returned here and uh, gone back to the theatre and so on, but done all that. But um, my, my life is fantastic. Uh, I don't boast about it because it's a mystery to me. And I will just tell you one other thing. Oh, no, this is a bit of personal. No, we will. Um, there's a decision. My, my, my wife, I said, uh, we, 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 we were talking about something about... Um, um, a, 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 a wonderful uh, um, cinematographer, Dante Spinotti, uh, we'd made a film together some years ago and we, he'd been a uh, photographer on the film that I directed and wrote. And he, as a favor, he asked me if I would be in his son's film, Ricardo's film, on just a small part. And... And I'd had these messages. Stella had answered them. She said, well, he's been very busy and I can't do it. 
So anyway, a week last Friday, we went downtown. Uh, we went to the, you know, we had the date day. We went down to the large one, had a Greek room, and she did a lot of shopping, as she loves to do, and I followed her around like a good husband. And she said, you are being a very good husband today, a hen-pecked husband. I said, well, how do I get B plus, maybe, maybe A plus? That's the joke we have, because I hate shopping. <laughs> but she loves, and I, I, I go a lot of shopping with her. She wants to buy everything. I don't know why she buys so many things, but anyway, she does. And uh, I find it funny. And um, she said, well, you've been a, a, a very good husband today. I said, you know what, I want an ice cream. And she said, okay. And so we drove back, and we were going through the Palisades, and um, we stopped at this yoga bar, and as we got out, there was this woman sitting at the table, and so I said, that's Marcella Spinati. I said, oh, yeah. She said, you know, they've been writing to us, asking if you'll do the film. I said, well, why didn't you tell me? She said, well, you were too busy. I said, well, let's do it. So I said, hey, Marcella, how are you? She said, hey, Tony, I've, ah, would you be in the film? So I was in the film last week. Did oh, a small part. But it's led on to something else, which is another bonus for... <laughs> but it's those sort of things that just by chance, by saying yes to something, instead of saying no all the time, he's so used to saying, no, I don't want to do that. Do it. I say, you know, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> just do it, because that's life. Say yes to life. I'm sure at the end of it all, whatever runs this universe, I read something some old guy said, maybe it was Woody Allen or something, he said, or somebody said, that whatever the divinity is, whatever God is or is not, whatever it is, whatever supreme intelligence runs this thing, I'm, maybe there's a question, I gave you the earth to live on, why didn't you enjoy it more? So true. You know, and I told these guys earlier on, you gave me one of my favorite quotes in life. And you said this to me years and years ago. You said, when I grow up, all I want to be is a little boy. <laughs> yes. Well, I carry in my phone. My phone went off. I won't show you. But I carry in my phone. It's here somewhere. I carry in my phone a photograph of, of myself as a, as a little kid. 1942, I was four years of age on the beach with my father during the war. That's how old I am. I was four years of age, and you couldn't get sweets or candies in those days, but my father was, and we were on the beach. My father was um, with another guy, and uh, this man gave me, a, gave me a cough sweet, you know, a cough pastel, the only sugar a little kid would like. And I dropped it in the sand, and I started crying. And the man said, Cliff Mathers, I always remember, they said, yeah, there's another one. And I smiled, and he caught a photograph of me. You know, I, with the, I can I remember looking down my shoes that I had little sandals, and I, and I remember that photograph being taken, and I put it in my phone, and I look at him and I said, "We did okay, kid. We did okay." I was a lost child. We did okay, and here I am today. And then I can contrast that with other things I know. But I have uh, we have a very close friend of ours who's. Sister was found last year in a crack tent up in Sepulveda, beaten to death and dead, 29 years of age. That's the dark side of it all. That's the thing that kills us. But it's all about how we think. We can talk, we can talk and go to therapy and think about how we think, but the more we talk about it, the worse it gets. We can change our thought by stilling the mind, by quietening down, by taking things easy. And in my outfit, they say, easy does it. Slow down. First things first. Take me a long time to learn that. But I think in those moments of stillness, those moments of decision, we can actually say, this is what I want, this is what I intend to be. I don't know how, you know, I, I've, I've had a wonderful life and I hope I go on having many more years of it. But it is attitude and it is how we think at this moment. If, you f if we feel for one moment that we are losing, change the thought, change it to I'm winning. And I have sayings, and I talk to myself all the time. I say all kinds of nice, good things about myself, as if they're happening in the present. And that's what I started doing all those years ago. I'm alive, I'm well, and I'm filled with perfect and abundant life. It is none of my business what people say of me or think of me. I am what I am, and I do what I do for fun and for free, because it's worth doing. 
It's all in the game, the wonderful game, the play of life upon life itself. Nothing to win, nothing to prove, nothing to win, nothing to lose. No sweat, no big deal. There are no big deals, only life itself. That's, That's awesome. Thank you. That's amazing. Yeah, let's give it up for Sir Anthony Hopkins. I'm going to let three students really quickly ask you questions because I promised they would. Come on down, you guys, real quick. <laughs> I've become a real Californian. Look at that. <laughs> Where am I? Yes, okay. The microphone's right there. Hello. Thank you for being here. Introduce yourself. Please. I'm Nicole Vandervoort. Thank you. Yeah. How do you separate real success and fulfillment from financial wealth? How do I what? Separate real success and, and fulfillment from financial wealth. How do, I, how do I define it? Yep. Yeah, how do you seek real success and passion in your life rather than the money, basically? Well, if you chase the money, it's not going to work. And if you chase success, it's not going to work. You just have to believe whatever image you have of yourself, whatever you want to be. You, we, you can say success or wealthy. Or whatever you want to be. Um, it's difficult to see. You have to have an image in yourself of what you want to become. But live it as if it is happening now. Act as if you are already there. And it'll fall in place. I don't know how the mystery works, but if we act as if it is already there, there's a great uh, act as if, William James says, act as if you already there are those things that you desire to be. As we think, as so are we. Um, and that's, that's called intentionality. I think, you know, sometimes, you know, I've, I've done work because they offer me good money. I say, okay, let's do it. Have some fun with it. But don't take it too seriously with it. Just do what you have to do. But if we set up to say, oh, I've got to have this, I've got to have that, it will go away. It'll never happen. And I, I know the people in it's a very tough business I'm in, the acting profession, and I know lots of young people want to be in it. And I say, um, I say, shape up. Don't think that you can wander around. You have to work hard at it. You have to be di very disciplined. Whatever you choose to be, I don't know what you want to do when you you know, in the future. But whatever it is, whatever you're seeking, and don't talk about it too much. Talk about it to yourself. I remember sitting in the National Theatre years ago, hundreds of years ago, and they'd all be, and I was the loner sitting in my room. And I never said anything to anyone, but I thought one day I'm going to be out of here. Now, I had nothing against the people I was working with. I just didn't feel fit in. So I didn't, and that's a very strange dilemma for somebody who doesn't fit in. <laughs> you have to work, work with other people. But something in me kept going. I thought, one day, one day, and it was used it with anger, one day I'm out of here. But act as if you already are those things. Whatever awesome. they are, keep that image in your mind and it'll happen. Thank you. Hi. Hi, my name is Juan Rodriguez. Um, Hi. I was asking... Um, how would you say that the acting industry has changed throughout the years in your experience? How the acting business has changed? Yes, sir. Well, I, d I, I, I guess it has changed a lot because now everything is highly corporate and um, I, d I don't really have an answer for that, but I know it has changed. I talked to my agent once and my, he said, oh, it's changed ra so rapidly, you can't keep up. There. These huge combines like HBO and uh, Amazon and these Great corpora corporations with them, billionaires and making decisions. Um, direct, direct, um, what, what little I know, I, I don't want to step out of line here because I don't know. But I, there are rumors that um, this changed so drastically. I was on uh, something recently where uh, directors are pushed around by producers, by the big corporate powers. And I wouldn't like to be in that position. And I know one director who was really feeling sore because. Um, Whenever he made a decision as a director, he, but somebody else would take it over and take it from him. And I said, how do you live with that? He said, I don't know. I said, well, get out of it. Become an independent film. I don't know. I don't have any answers. I know that uh, independent films are probably um, one of the ways. But yes, it has changed radically. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump uh, in I, here. I, and I'm just going to say one, one thing. Go I, ahead. I think something that has has happened, and uh, um, 
No, we are living in the reality age now, you know. You can be famous for nothing. If you look beautiful or you can do this, you can do anything, you can be famous. So you can just get on your phone and become famous. I think there's a downside to that. Um, and I... I, 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 I um, I say to anyone who wants to be an actor, for example, it's not you say, oh, hey, cool, man, let's just, uh, you know. I know a couple of guys, they think it's hip and, you know, cool to just uh, slop around and say, I'm going to be a movie star. I say, oh, yeah? How are you going to do that? When you're just hanging around, you're too lazy to learn your lines. It takes a lot of discipline, it takes a lot of determination, it takes a lot of muscle power to become an actor to really do it. And there's a great payoff because the more disciplined you are, the more powerful you become. And I'll give you an example. And uh, this is not blowing my own trumpet, but I went back to England to do King Lear. The British way of working is different to the American way. A, there's not that much money and there's not that much big power, star power. But what they do, and I worked with people recently on this King Lear, they're very professional. They all know their stuff. And I determined when, when I was going to play this part to learn every single line of Lear. So much so, over and over and over and over. So you drive yourself mad until you get there. So you know it so fully that when you go into the rehearsal, you go onto the film set, whoa, and, they, and you're unstoppable. And I will, I know you showed that Hannibal Lecter thing. I remember when I got that part all those years ago. And uh, my agent for me said, there's a wonderful film called Silence of the Lambs. I said, okay, what, what, what is it, a children's story? He said, no. He said, the part of a Hannibal Lecter. I said, okay. So I read about part of it and I phoned him up. I said, I don't want to read anymore. Is this a deal? He said, well, I'm not sure. I said, I don't want to read anymore because the part is so good. I don't want to be disappointed. He phoned me back an hour later. He said, Jonathan Demi's coming into London to see you tonight, tomorrow. I was in the theatre at the time. And I got that part. But what I'd learned years before that is the discipline, because it does take discipline. Nothing is for free. I think that's the problem we live today, that everyone thinks, oh, I'm owed this. You owe me this. I want to be famous. Okay, well, fine. You can... I don't know how you're going to do that. But it takes discipline. It takes tremendous energy. It takes aggressive, arrogant energy. These are all buzzwords that we are frightened of. Yes, you have to be egotistical. You have to have power. You have to have that power of drive. After all, we're going to be dead one day. But you have to have that power of drive. And to show up not knowing your stuff is deadly and it's embarrassing. And I've worked with people like that. They don't know they're, what they're doing. But they're, they have an attitude. Like they don't talk to the film crew because they're special. And I said to one of them, I said, who do you think puts your stupid face up on the screen? The props guys, the cameraman, the makeup lady, the, everyone. You don't do it yourself. Wake up. That's all I say. There's a wonderful book, and I would encourage you all to read it. By, by, um, I'm going to sell this book. The Dorothea Brand, she wrote a book in the 1930s. And it's called Wake Up and Live... Act as if it is impossible to fail. It's a book you can get, you can download it, or you can buy it in book. I don't think bookshops are open anymore, but you can buy them. Wake up and live. And to answer your question indirectly, am I running out of time? No. No. But to answer your question directly about how to change, uh, Dorothea Brandt was a journalist. She was content with her life, but she was unhappy, really, because she couldn't finish things. She couldn't get it together. Something happened. She just was disappointed. And she read a book by a man called Myers. It's all in her book. And she came across this one little thing. I don't know if it was a hypnotist or a psychiatrist. This is back in the 30s. She came across this one, wake act as if it is impossible to fail. It changed her life. She wrote five books in within two years. She went on lecture tours. And she would give examples of people who would say, you know, they're all around us, and God bless them, I don't know, maybe. Well, I, I, we all know them, I've known them myself. And people say, so how did it work? Yeah, well, it didn't work out. Maybe it was meant to be. 
Yeah, <laughs> it's okay, I'm happy. Oh, really? And you examine and listen underneath and you hear the hatred and the bitterness and the anger and the hate success. But it's not a fault, it's not a... But it is, we have that in us. Wake up and live. Act as if it is impossible to fail. Awesome. And that's what I did when I was a young kid. And, and you know what but else I want to add? When you say, how has the... Act yeah, the acting world has changed tremendously. But to your credit, you've done something in the product and industry world we call, you've created a category killer. Your brand is so strong, there's really nobody competing with you. Like if somebody writes a part in a film that's a character like you, you're pretty much gonna get it. There isn't another actor out there that can do what you're doing. And, and if, if, if you were a dental product, you would be a category killer in the, in the dental world. Oh, thank you. Uh, but that's it because then I come back to the boss, my wife. <laughs> because every so often I say, what do you mean my, my, you know, I complain about something? But my, because I'm only human. But she said, stop that. She said, how, she said to me, she said, how do you expect, how, do you realize you've just done this and you've just done that and you did that last year and you got a brand here and you did She's Brioni amazing. Suits I love Stella. That? I said, yeah. She said, who do you think did that? You, dummy. I said, yeah. She said, well, you did. So I fall back and said, yeah, well, she said, you did it. Or some power within me that got me here, destiny or fate, whatever it is, gave me that so-called power or that power, whatever it was, that put me there. And I'm going to, I've just turned 80. I'm going to be 81 at the end of December. I've got an art show in Hawaii. I've got a concert next year, maybe in Moscow, in the Lenin, I don't know. But all these things have. But the movie industry has changed. And now it's being taken over by the great conglomerates. But I mean, did you all meet Mark Wahlberg yesterday? Oh, was they he, loved Mark. Mark was great. Yeah, yes. Mark was one of those. He worked with you. Yeah, I worked with Mark. And he's one of those guys who was so motivated. He's in bed by 8.15 every night or so. And uh, he's got, um, you know, he's always on. He's, he works out every morning and he's there on the set. And he's got his own brand of plans. Hamburgers and, and water. Ah, yes, yeah, all that. everything. All yeah. right, we're going to do okay. one last question quickly. I'm Hi, I'm I'm Angus from Australia. And um, I was just wondering, you've had such a diverse range of characters that you've played in your life, you know, from Silence of the Lambs to The World's Fastest Indian, two of my favourite movies. Um, I'm just wondering, before you, once you've got the role and before you're about to shoot, how do you immerse yourself in those characters' lifestyles? How do I immerse myself in the characters? I just learn the lines. But it's true, because if you, the lines are all uh, method actors, how would you get into the bar? Well, you just work and work and work, and go over and over the text as it's written, whether it's King Lear or Hannibal Lecter or World's Fastest Engine. Just go over it, prepare it, prepare it. In the preparation, as Hamlet said, the preparation is all. And from the information within the text, you get all the information you need. So people say, well, how do you play a serial killer? I say, I don't know, just learn the lines and make a couple of little switches here and there. How do you play a man who's mad? Play him sane, totally sane. Good morning. You're not real FBI, are you? Things like, hello, Clarice. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's awesome. <laughs> but if I say, hello, Clarice. Good morning. You know what you look like to me with your good bag and your sheep shoes? You look like a rube. Wow, scrubbed hustling rube. That's more frightening to anyone, especially behind a glass case. The tarantula, boom, boom, boom. That's awesome. So one of the things that we do at Leap is really teach these young people to believe in themselves. So we're going to leave you with something. On your feet, you guys. Let's do it for him. I am. I am. Come on, we could do better. I am. I am. A, ten. a 10. I walk like a 10. I, walk like a 10. I, talk, like a 10. I talk like a 10. And I always do, and I always do. What, I do. what I ought to do when I ought to do it. Do it. No debates. Because no I, I am a 10. A 10. Thank you.
know why you invited me here, because you got it. <laughs> what, what was that again? Do it again. What is it? I am a 10? I am a 10. I am a 10. There you go. <laughs> well, you do it again. What is it? I am, I am. A, ten. a 10. I walk like a 10. I, walk like a ten. I talk like a 10. And I always do. I always do. What I to do. When I to do it. No debates. Because I really am a 10. That's fantastic. You're fantastic. a 20. Thank you. That is fantastic. All right, thank, thank you, you so you. much. We're going you. to go out and take a few photos. Thank you so much. Thank you all. He's got it. He's the boss.